Hello, my name's Annabelle and I'm one of the leaders at Woodville Baptist. Today I have the joy of talking about the passage that runs from 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 22 through to chapter 2 verse 3, following on from where our pastor Josh got up to last week. So let's pray and then we'll read the passage. Father God, I pray that you would uh, use these words to speak to us, to change our lives, and that you would give us listening ears and hearts. Amen. Okay, so the passage says, Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable <clears throat> through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Know that now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Okay, so let's look again at the first verse. It says, Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. So firstly, what is the truth that we are to obey? Well, this whole passage is all about God's word. The entirety of the Bible and God's revelation of his word to us, which is Jesus. Jesus was described as the word and he also claimed to be the truth. So the truth we are to to obey is the same as the word, which is the same as Jesus. And it means we've heard his call to repentance and come and ask for forgiveness and come into relationship with him. As an aside here, if you don't know that you have obeyed the truth in that way, please do get in touch. We would love to talk more with you about that. Now, as we obey the truth or word, we are purified. This makes sense because as we accept the offer of Jesus to come to him for forgiveness and cleansing from our sin, he does indeed take the eternal consequence of our sin away bring us into a new relationship with him and we're purified as the Holy Spirit moves into our hearts. And it is assumed that the work of the Holy Spirit then leads to sincere love for our brothers. Now, don't get hung up on the male word here. It simply means that we have a sincere love for the church. So, now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, what next? Well, then we are to love deeply from the heart. The Bible talks so much about love, but to draw attention to a few related passages, because it's always good to see how the word hangs together. Romans 12 verse 9 says, love must be sincere. Jesus said in John's gospel, love one another. And in 1 Thessalonians, it says, you do love all of God's family, yet we urge you to do so more and more which is very similar to what we see here. And Galatians 6 verse 10 says, Let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Now the word used for deeply when it says love one another deeply is implying strenuous effort rather than depth of feeling. After all, we can't really control our innate feelings But we can control how much effort we put into serving others, caring for them and stretching ourselves for them. So Peter is saying, you've been purified by obeying the truth, therefore you love your church, but now love still more. Make an effort. And why so much emphasis on loving these people who just happen to be part of the church with you? Well, the next verse says, for you you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. This idea of being born again crops up also in Titus 3 verse 5, where it says he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. And as we looked at recently in James 1 verse 18, it says he chose to give us birth through the word of truth. 
So in other words, when we come into relationship with God through repentance and faith in Jesus, we're given a new spiritual birth through the direct action of the Holy Spirit. We are now a new creation, not physically, but spiritually. And it says we have been born again through the word of God because because it is through the word that we actually hear the gospel and the word calls us to repent. This reminds me of the parable of the the sower, excuse me, where he is sowing seed in various places and some falls on good ground, which grows fruit. And this refers to when we hear the word of God and we respond with repentance and then we're given new life. And when people are born, they are born into a family, not a vacuum. However dysfunctional or not that family might be, there is always a family around that child. And when we're born again spiritually and become Christians, we are born not into a vacuum, but into a family of believers, which is the worldwide church. Now, hopefully we quickly find a local church to be our more tangible spiritual family as well. And if you haven't yet done that, then I would urge you to attempt to do so. Myself, my testimony is that I became a Christian and didn't find a church for a couple of years, mainly because I was a child and I didn't really understand what I'd done and all the rest of it. And God still uh, grew me. The Holy Spirit still changed me. Reading the word changed me. But being part of a local church family is his design for us because we are not born into a vacuum. And this time when we are born we're born of imperishable seed. The imperishable seed is the word of God, which it says is living and enduring. The word of God is eternal. It will never disappear. As part of my research, I read on the Enduring Word website that in AD 303, the Roman Emperor Diocletian demanded that every copy of the scriptures in the Roman Empire be burned. He failed, and 25 years later, the Roman Emperor Constantine commissioned a scholar named (coughs) Eusebius to prepare 50 copies of the Bible at government expense. Excuse me. In fact, the Bible is the most read and best-selling book of all time. They don't even bother to list it in the bestseller lists because it is always top. Five billion copies have been printed and the New Yorker says it is the best-selling book of the year every year. So back to the passage, Peter goes on to quote Isaiah 40 verse 6 to 8 which says, all men are like grass and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall but the word of the Lord stands forever. The word, which is Christ, stands forever. We were born to be perishable, but as we take up our new lives in Christ, we are given eternity. We are born into a new spiritual reality, which is eternal. We will one day be given new imperishable physical bodies and will be stuck with our new spiritual family for all eternity in heaven. Perhaps that's why we better start loving them deeply now. In chapter two, then, he goes on to say that this eternal, living, enduring word was what was preached to us. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy and slander. It's the word of God that helps us grow. Because we've listened to the word and acted on it, we have been born again. But we're not instantly perfect. We're still liable to temptation. And so... We have to make an effort to rid ourselves of the things that will kill the love that we're trying to grow for our new spiritual family. Malice is the desire to harm someone. Instead, we should be taking care not to harm our brothers and sisters. Deceit is keeping the truth hidden, whereas we are told that love rejoices with the truth. Hypocrisy is pretending to be what one is not. But to be in loving relationship, we need to be more truthful than that. Envy is a feeling of discontented or resentful longing caused by looking at what others have. 
The Bible tells us that love doesn't envy because we want the best for others. Slander is making false damaging statements about others. This is not how brothers and sisters who love each other will behave. Rid yourselves of these things. It doesn't say, if you feel these things, avoid them. It assumes we will feel sinful things and we are to be proactively getting rid of them. Now, these are a frequent sight in our home. For those of you who are listening rather than watching, I'm referring to a baby bottle with milk. Now to us, they probably symbolise lack of sleep, endless sterilising and cost. But to the children that we look after, they symbolise life, needs met, love, satisfaction and relief. And as we consistently meet the little one's needs for milk, we're building healthy neural pathways that tell them that adults can be trusted and they are secure in the world. Especially when the baby is newborn, when they need milk, their cries are communicating that the world will end for them if you don't feed them right now. And they don't yet have a memory built up that reassures them that you will in fact meet their needs. The newborn craving for milk is frequent and fervent. Now, we're told in verse 2 to be like newborn babies and crave spiritual milk so that by it we may grow up in our salvation. Throughout this passage, we've described God's word as truth, imperishable, living, enduring forever, and now it is described as milk. In 1 Corinthians 3 verse 2, however, Paul says, I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And in Hebrews 5 verse 12 to 14, it talks about how they should be on solid food, but are still on milk. However, in this passage, it's not using the image of milk as an unfavourable contrast to solids. But because the context is us being born again, it is using the image of milk to describe an entirely appropriate sustenance for a newborn. The Greek for when it says grow up in our salvation means normal growth or for those of us who work in childcare, we would call it meeting milestones. Basically, God's word does not leave us as it finds us and we need it in order to grow and develop normally as Christians to meet our milestones. Just as a baby needs milk to grow and develop normally, we must crave it therefore. We should be crying out for it frequently and fervently because we know it is essential for our growth. If we're not doing so, we have been blinded and blunted by the lie that it's unnecessary, which is as absurd as a newborn baby being told that it doesn't need milk. So, like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tested that the Lord is good. <clears throat> the Greek tense here of have tasted shows that it is something that happened once. We had an initial encounter with God, and because it tasted good, we therefore long for more. One commentary that I read pointed out that in order to taste something, you need to get close to it. We can't taste something from a distance in the way that you might see something from a distance or hear from a distance or even smell from a distance. The only way to taste something is to get up close and personal. So get up close and personal to God so that you can taste that he is good. Draw near to him if you haven't already. He is good. So there are some natural challenges arising from this passage. Are you drawing close enough to God to taste him or are you observing from a distance? How much are you craving God's word? Do you see Woody as your spiritual family or as a bunch of friends or acquaintances? And if you're listening in and you're not from Woody, then think about your own local church that you're part of. Are they your family or just a bunch of people that you, you know? How hard are you working to love the people of Woody deeply? And as with all challenges, the secret is not to beat yourself up about perceived failing, 
but rather to ask God to help you in these areas. So let's pray. Father God, I pray that you would help us to draw close to you, maybe for the first time, maybe to taste you for the first time, or maybe we just need to rekindle our first love. Father, help us to crave your word. I pray that you would grow in each of us a a craving that frequently and fervently wants to be in your word. And Father, I pray that you would help us in Woody to see each other as family, not as friends or acquaintances. With all the good and bad that family brings, but that you would help us to love each other deeply, that we would make effort to love each other. Amen. Thank you for listening. I hope that you have a great week. If there's anything that I've said that you'd like to talk about further, then please do get in touch on all the usual channels. And we will be back next week with more from 1 Peter. God bless.